I got so many things I want to talk about, I'll never get them all done, but uh, I've uh, been thinking lately, and, and our lessons, our Sabbath school lessons, in fact, uh, uh, you think I'm serious about it? <laughs> I, went and, I went to the bookstore and bought all three books. You know, sometimes it's amazing. The pastor doesn't get a Sabbath school quarterly. <laughs> if, if I'm not at the regular church, and I'm visiting, as they say. Lou, you didn't hear that, did you? <laughs> the pastor is visiting with us today. As sad as it might be in some sense, I'm the pastor of the Waynesboro Church, the Adamsville Church, the Bethel Springs, and Savannah. But everybody kind of considers that I'm the pastor of the Savannah Church. But I'm pastor of all these churches. But anyway, I'll be at one of the other churches other than Savannah on the Sabbath. They hand out the Sabbath school books, and I don't always get one. And uh, now, Waynesboro gave me one, just so you know. One quarter, I, I got one in Waynesboro. But I was at another church, and they said, oh, you'll probably get yours from Savannah. <laughs> so... I had to go a week or two without a book, but anyway, I was at the at the bookstore and I wanted to get the, the notes, Ellen White notes, and and uh, this uh, book by Dennis uh, Fortin, who's who's uh, one of the writers in the Sabbath School Corner. But one in Christ. Do you think that's important? I mean, there's a whole lot in this book that's important. I mean, there's there is a lot in this book that's important, right? And Jesus could have talked about any of that stuff in this book when he's there with his disciples in that other upper room. But you know what burdened his heart? That you may be one. Now I've, I've uh, shared messages about this over the years. I've, I've prayed a lot about it. I've worked on it. But it's come to a focal point lately. And like I was saying, the general <clears throat> conference was meeting in their, their fall uh, meetings. I, I got a number of phone calls from some of the saints. I, I got phone calls from a couple of my colleagues about what's going on and what they're deciding and so forth. And what do you know? Well, I'm supposed to be on the end, you know, with the track. Now, I do hear things and I do know a little of what's going on. But I want to tell you this. I have little influence with what happens there. With the exception of I give my opinion to anyone that might ask about any of those topics. I do share from time to time a concern that I might have with some of the brethren that I know. But other than that, I have the same influence you have. And it's awesome and powerful. Are you listening to me? I can talk at any moment to the God of the universe. And he hears what I have to say when I'm concerned about his church and his people. All right? And it's true for you. So I, I titled the message today, Oneness at what cost? Now, I'm sorry it didn't get into bulletin. I did text it to, uh, so, yes, she's looking at me. I, I have the text to show you. I think I sent it to the wrong number. <laughs> but I, I text my information to them. And then I, last night I looked and I saw a text message asking me, could you text us? And that was already bygone, right? But anyway, so, so I, I did not get it into bulletin. But oneness at what cost? And I'd selected the scripture, one that we've been looking at quite a bit uh, during this, this quarter, uh, John 17, uh, 17 through 22. Now I want to ask you to bow your heads with me as we open God's word this morning. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us. And Lord, today I don't want to be redundant. I don't want to talk about things that, that we already know 
things that we think already have been discussed. But I want to speak about something that's still, I believe, first and foremost on your heart. And that each of us need to settle in our own minds that we may truly be one as you are with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Bless us that we might draw near to you, that you might speak to us today that transforming thoughts might come together in our minds, that truly it might be settled for us personally, that we may be one. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, for a few years I was involved in, in Christian education. I was teacher, a dean, principal, and I care about our young people being educated. I, I got to the point, I, th I thought maybe I wasn't making the difference I wanted to be able to make where I was, and I kept sensing that the Lord had something else that I need to be doing, and people were telling me, well, you, you ought to be a pastor. You really should be a pastor. And I would hear that from different, different folks, saints in the church and, and friends of mine and so forth, and I prayed about it, and I put the fleece out because I hadn't trained to be a pastor. And, and God answered, just like with Gideon, one fleece and another fleece, and you know. And, and things happened and doors opened in a way that it was not something that I could touch or do. And I knew God's hand was in it. I, I left Harvard Hills in the middle of the school year, something I hadn't planned to do. I got a call to the ministry from my local conference, a conference that wasn't hiring at the time. You listening? The ministerial secretary told me, you know, we're, we're letting pastors go when they retire, when they get a call out, and we're putting districts together and, and adding churches to other pastors. We're, you know, financially the conference was in a really bad way. They, they let people go out of the conference office, about seven positions in the conference office at the time. I'm just telling you this to tell you that when they hired me, they weren't hiring. They told me, you know, we'll give you a recommendation to another conference. I had gone and been going, taking the lay pastors training for a number of years when they had those uh, meetings. Uh, a couple times a year I would go to the training they were giving. And I was leading in my local church. I had been since I was about 25 years old. I, I became an elder in a church at 25. It was kind of strange to me because I was anything but an elder. You know, this, we had uh, teachers just coming out of college who weren't much older, you know, younger than me, you know, that, that uh, were in my, my church. So I was one of the youngest people in my church as far as uh, adults were concerned, and, and they made me an elder. Well, they didn't have much choice. You see, there was... Uh, me and one other gentleman who were members of the church and they didn't do the lady elders at the time okay now I don't think that's the only reason they asked me to be an elder but they did and and I, I pity what those folks had to listen to those first few sermons I will tell you this they were short back in those days <laughs> Somebody said amen, I heard it. It was a whisper. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm telling you this, try to, try to lay a little, little groundwork. I was pretty feisty as a young man. I, I thought I knew a lot of things. And, and I was very um, connected in my heart with self-supporting work. And I, and I believed in us independently serving the Lord in various capacities throughout the world. And I had seen, even at a young age, some of the problems that happen in the organization. 
And I will tell you this, the bigger the organization gets, the, the greater the opportunity for problems and dysfunction and, and following anything but the Lord, all right? And therefore, having said that, we ought to what? Pray for our leadership. Pray for our institutions. Someone gave a testimony last week that probably never should have been given. And they were confessing the sins of a couple of our institutions, some of our hospitals, out loud in Sabbath school. We ought to be careful how we do that. Did anybody hear me? We ought to be really careful because God may have his people in those institutions who have not yet risen to the point of leadership that can make a difference. But they're there serving the Lord to the best of their ability and the capacity they have. And when you talk about that institution, you're talking about those people too. And the other thing is, you don't know your own heart. What kind of decisions, what kind of compromises would you make were you the leader of that institution? What kind of challenges might they face that you know not of? I'm talking about oneness at what cost. Now I take my scripture. There was a falling out in the church before there was really a good church. The church had two members. Right? Who were they? Somebody says Cain and Abel. All right? The church had two leaders. Who were they? Adam and Eve. They were outside the garden because already there had been a falling away in the church. Anybody listening? When it was Adam and Eve, one man and one woman who were supposed to be one what? One flesh. Adam and Eve was created from a rib from Adam. They were as much as you could possibly be, what? One flesh. And Eve, for whatever cause, finds herself at the tree of knowledge of good and evil where God has said, don't go there. You can eat of all the other stuff. God made every provision for their health and happiness, well-being, for how long? For eternity. There was no heart disease, no cancer, no people dying with children left behind. None of this kind of stuff going on. There was no riots, no wars, no calamities, hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunamis, right? None of that. Read those first two chapters of the scripture again. If there, you'll find that utopia, right? The perfection. And I got good news. It's in here twice. Turn back to the last two chapters and there it is again. And I'm, I'm talking about oneness at what cost. You see, the attack of the opposition started in the garden amidst perfection. In fact, we can take it further back than that. There in heaven, and not just in heaven, but in the most holy place in heaven, there at the very throne of God, evil arose and unity was disrupted and ever since God has been working toward are you listening God has his agenda never mind the general conference agenda 
God has his agenda, never mind the, the Waynesboro Church. And I, I don't want to say this out loud, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. Sometimes we have more people at board meeting than we have at prayer meeting. People will come to church business meetings that do not come even regularly to church. Because they want to have an effect in making, this, in making decisions and saying what happens and doesn't happen. You know, we want to exercise our control over things, right? And God has been working since that sin. In fact, he had a plan in place even before sin arrived on the scene. Amen? I'm trying to tell you that there are no surprises to God. God is never caught off guard. If we care to read the testimonies, which some of us are afraid of and some of us are too proud to and some of us are too critical to, if we would read, we will find out God has already told us what's coming down the pike. The, the question we have to ask and answer for ourselves, am I going to be on a board United with God and what he's doing when the final act closes. When the final act closes, where will I be standing? Upon whose side of the controversy will I be when the final act closes? That's the vital question for us. I, I, yeah, I dared... And I don't encourage this to, I don't encourage you to do this, but I'm telling you, I dared to do this. After the general conference meeting, in fact, one day during the general conference meeting, I, I opened up my computer. I looked on the comments and the social media, and there were Seventh day Adventist Christians spewing before the world, their vehemence, their disunity and dislike, and dare I say it, hatred for one another. And Jesus had prayed what? For them, each and every one of them. And how quickly we forget that Jesus prays for us Ellen White describes that Jesus comes alongside of us. With his mighty arm, he reaches around us. With his other arm, he reaches up and grabs hold of omnipotence and connect us with heaven when we draw near to him. In fact, he is drawing us even when we're going the other way. And I like what the preacher said the other night, Pastor Don Pate, I've been going to those week of prayer meetings and he said, you know, God will use our rejection to his glory. Huh? There is a king in defiance out there on the plain of Dura. And he puts up this great golden image. <laughs> Who gave him the dream to put the idea for that image there? You know, God has already said, you're the head of gold. He said, no, it's all gold. All the way down to the toenails, it's gold. He liked to hear those people say, oh, king, live forever. And he said, yeah, that's me. All right. So he puts that great image up there. He says, come and worship. I want you to bow down before this. And he had three young men who said, no. No. That's not what we worship. We worship just like Jesus said, the God only and him only are we going to serve. We're not bowing down to anything else. We don't need any second chances. We don't need any time to pray. We already know whose we are and what we're going to worship. And I wonder about us. I'm talking about oneness at what cost. Uh, yeah, so there's that great king. And God looking down. And he sees that Nebuchadnezzar has not taken his message to heart. 
In fact, he's pretty much ignored what God said is going to take place. And he is so full of himself and so not about unity with God that he says, I'm going to kill your children because they didn't worship me. I'm going to throw them in a fire. And he looks in the fire when they're in there and he sees them not burned up, not smoke and ashes, but he sees what? Four walking around in that furnace. And he said something amazing for a heathen king. He said the fourth looks like the son of man. Where did that come from? You know where he saw Jesus? He saw Jesus in the lives of four young men who stood tall for Jesus in their lives. Who were not willing to conform to the ways of the world around them but would stand tall no matter what. And so I wonder about us. Because you see, if we're united with Jesus, we're not going to have any problem getting along with each other. When I'm connected as I ought to be with God, when my prayer life is what it ought to be, when my study is consistent, I have less argument with my wife. I went ahead and said that out loud. <laughs> we ought not to be able to get up from prayer and start acting like the devil when we've been talking to the Lord. All right? It ought not be. Our commitment ought to be consistent day by day. And we need to grow more and more that way. And less and less of this other stuff will matter to us. Now I'm not trying to tell you I'm not concerned about my church and the throes of, of turmoil that are happening within my church. But it's only a reflection of the world that we live in, right? Huh? How we go about things. Now I said I was in education <clears throat> for a while. I had people despair about how education was going and about the con compromises happening within our schools and, and how they would talk about the leadership and the conference and the whoever that was over these schools and I said, hey folks, you're looking at the wrong problem. You're looking even at the wrong people. Do you know where our leadership comes from? Pardon? God sets them up, but where does he get them? This is what we need to think about. Where is God getting those leaders that he's setting up? Huh? Let me bring it to you real. He's getting them at your house. They're coming from your homes, from your churches, from your schools. That's where God gets his leaders that he puts there, right? Now, I know some of them come from the community at large that they didn't, they didn't happen to be here with us much, but if they're going to be very high in leadership, at some point they're going to be sitting among us. Huh? So if we want to change the church, if we want the church to become unified, where does it need to start? It needs to start one heart, one home, one church. Huh? Huh? Where'd the Holy Spirit start? With the upper room. It started where? In the hearts of those disciples. As they prayed for it. As they looked and co comprehended that, hey, this work that Jesus has left with us is way bigger than us. And there's no possible way on earth that we're the men who can carry out the mission that he's given us. What did he say? I mean, when you think of the awesome commission God gave those disciples, he said, I want you to go where? All the world. To every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And you're going to be doing what? Teaching and baptizing. And they said, there's no possibility. Why did Jesus leave here and say, I'm going to send the Spirit? Because he knew that even God in human form could not reach the world 
He could only be at one place at one time, right? And so when we look at the stark reality, dare we think any one of us that our ideas, our influence, our work is going to change and transform the world, we're messed up. But through the power of the Spirit, as my life touches another, as I, you know, it can spread like wildfire. And very soon, you know how long it would take to take the gospel to the world? Pardon? Anybody know how quickly? <laughs> you know, it could just be a matter of days. One to one to one. You know, we, we talk about, and I, I put a little note in my Bible a, a while back. My wife and I were talking, and she said, you know, <laughs> they're making so big a deal about the, the wireless connection. This was back a few years ago, right? When they first started getting wireless, where you could have your computer uh, connected there, and, and you, didn't have to, you didn't have to actually have it plugged in. You know, you had this router sitting over here, and your computer can work off that router and other things in your house. You guys know all this stuff. You knew it before I did, right? She said, hey, God had the first wireless connection way back. He gave us prayer. Huh? Prayer. First wireless connection. Huh. I'll tell you something. Your wireless connection ever fail? You ever, you ever had that connection just drop out on you? You ever try to get and it won't boot up and you can't connect? And you had that? Huh. God's hadn't failed yet. Been going on for thousands of years. Hadn't had the first glitch. Right? Yeah. Jesus said to his disciples something that you and I need to take for face value. He said, all power. Huh? Matthew 28. 1920. He said, all, how much? All. all the power. Whatever it is that you need to do the work I'm giving you to do, I've got it. I've got all the power in heaven. got all the power on the earth. Now go. Right? And all you and I can see sometimes are the barriers. I'm amazed sometimes at our callousness as Christians. I was in a situation one time. A young person, teenager, want to give their heart to the Lord, want to be baptized. Some misguided saint Y'all be careful how you think about these people now because I'm calling them misguided. Said, oh yeah, you can be baptized this week. Yeah. We'll talk to the pastor and we'll get this thing going and, and you can be baptized. Well, there was another influential person there that said, oh yeah, we can make this happen. Now they come to the pastor. What have they promised? You can be baptized this week. Now we're talking about who? A teenager. Raised in an Adventist home. Godly father and mother. Leaders in their community. And this young person has decided, I want to be baptized. And the first thing someone said was, <laughs> she hadn't studied long enough. It takes a year, year and a half. You got, she got to be ready. She, she's not saying, oh, I want to be baptized because I just love Jesus so much. I just think so much. You know, she just didn't have the right phrases yet. And you know what I said? If you'll pose the same question to the saints in the church, why do you want to be baptized? I said, 
75, 80% of them won't have the right phrases either. Some of it is that we don't just necessarily all think alike, and the first thing pops in our mind, not the same thing somebody else is thinking, right? And we may mean the same thing, we just don't say it like they say it, right? I mean, I don't preach like Elder Fen uh, Fenley or, or uh, you know, uh, Carlton Bird. Uh, you know, do I believe the same message? Amen. Do I love the same Lord? Amen. But we're not the same people. We don't have the same background, education, experiences, culture, right? So, the pastor's kind of in the spot, right? He's been delivered a long, young lady who says what? So I go through the, the, with her. I'm going through. We're, we're studying. I'm sharing with her. I'm checking, you know, creation, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you know, all the things, baptism, state of the dead. We're going through all that. Oh, yeah, she has no problems. Christian lifestyle. You know what? Bless her heart. She, she hadn't taken up smoking, drinking, uh, partying, clubbing, all that kind of stuff. No, you know, not, not part of her experience. What has she got to be delivered from? As you and I look at it, little or nothing as far as temptation is concerned. Yes, she has a will to overcome, a, a, a surrender to make. Yes, amen, right? But she hasn't experienced and she hasn't picked up habits and so forth that many adults have that need to be overcome. And so I say to her, yes, you've made an affirmation, you've made a commitment, you love the Lord. You know, she, she wasn't frivolous as a young person. She was a, a quiet spirit, humble. Wow, what more could you ask for in a candidate for baptism, right? And yet someone says, ha, huh, no, Pastor, you can't be just grabbing them and baptizing just because they say, I throw the book at them. You see, I read the book Acts. There was people baptized same day. Huh? I don't think they were frivolous back then and careless about the, the baptism. I don't think I ought to be. But I'll tell you this, some people who have studied a long time just as quickly leave as those who have studied little time. Okay? And I can't read the heart, but I can tell a lot about uh, commitment and a person's uh, uh, level of, you know, decision. So, having said all that, why am I saying that? We're, we're too quick sometimes to put a wall in where there ought to be a door. We ought to be, as God's people, we ought to be trying to do everything we can to bring one another together and bring us to the foot of the cross. We, we ought to be, our whole life and being ought to be to get as many people into the kingdom of God as can pop, possibly be stuffed in there. And guess what? There's still room left. We can't get too many in there. Huh? And you know something else? I'm not diminished in the least by anybody else who comes. All right? You know, I shared with a young lady one time who had been left at the altar. You know what I'm saying? She came for her wedding day and her Bridegroom did not show up. You think the young lady was devastated? Oh, yeah. How, 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 how did she feel, you know, about this high? She felt rejected. It, it, she, she had been not just let down, but he hadn't even bothered to communicate, just didn't show up. And I said to her, you're not diminished by this. That, that's his character. That's who he is. This is not about you. God loves you just as much as he's ever loved anybody. And you are desirable. God knows that there is a person for you. Maybe God has just saved you from a nightmare of life, right? 
I said, you need to be rejoicing in the Lord. And I know that's, that's kind of, you know, expecting a little too much at that time when the tears are in your eyes, right? But I'm saying, you hold your head up. You're, you're a fine young lady. You have much to offer a husband. And this guy is not deserving of you. All right? We need, to, we need to help put things in perspective for people. And for ourselves, by the way. God loves us. John 3.16. Claim it. Amen. Whosoever will. Right? That's you and that's me. By the way, God hasn't finished his work in any of us as long as we're breathing. We need to look at our leadership and imagine what they might become if they're not what they ought to be through the power of God and the Holy Spirit. Because I read my scripture and those apostles, saints, they were not in that upper room even, right? And they were with who? Jesus in the very presence of the holiness of God. And they were bickering among themselves about who was going to be next or next. And, you know, they had their pecking order all put in place. We need to come to the place in our own hearts that it doesn't matter where we are in the pecking order. We're children of the heavenly God. Huh? And God loves us just like a mother. You try to tell her, hey, which, kid, which child you love the best. And try to get her to say it out loud in the presence of the rest of them. You know what she tells each one of them? I love you best. And the kids get to talking about it and say, she told me the same thing. How could that be? And that's God and us. All right, I'm talking here. Not fast enough, I see. I'm almost done. There were a lot of texts I was going to give you today, but I went to a different direction here. Uh, you know, God's purpose is going to be fulfilled. Ezekiel says so. Isaiah, Ezekiel 34, 26, 29 through 31. I want to just put a couple of things up on the screen for you as we're, as we're getting ready to close here. We've got Acts the Apostles, a couple of quotations. Uh, your Sabbath school lesson is full of all this stuff on unity. But I want to ask you something. Unity at what cost? You see, Jesus was very patient with his disciples. Judas was one of the what? How many? Count them. Twelve. And he said, one's a devil. How did Jesus treat that devil all the time of his ministry? When he sent them out, when he ordained them, he did what? Somebody say it. Jesus ordained Judas. If you're not careful, you would sit in judgment upon Jesus himself. Are you listening? Who of us would dare to do that? And yet if we're not careful, when we criticize our leadership, we're doing the same kind of thing. God is in control of this church. God's work is going to be finished upon the earth. He already knows how it's going to happen. Just because you don't doesn't mean it's not going to happen. We're, we're so careful, I mean, that we know all the details. Some of us will travel five, five, six hundred miles to find out some new present truth. All right, And I'm not against finding more truth, all right? Uh, as I told you, when I was young, I thought I had it. But as I've grown older, I found out there's a whole lot more to learn. And, and some, of the, some of the folks that are enemy are not the enemy. And some of the folks that are friends aren't either. All right? You'll find that out as you, as you work among things. But here it is. Wonderful is the work which the Lord designs to accomplish through what? His church. His, that his name, whose name? His name might be glorified. A picture of this work is given in Ezekiel's vision. It talks about that. Um, we won't read that. Go to the next one. All right. God chose Israel to reveal his character to men. He desired them to be as wells of salvation to the world. What do you think his purpose for us, Israel, today is? If you're Christ, you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise in Galatians 3.29. What's that make us? Israel. Spiritual Israel. 
All right, so he says, to them were committed the oracles of heaven and the revelation of what? God's will. In the early days of Israel, the nations of the world, through corrupt practices, had lost the knowledge of God. Does that sound like the world we live in? Amen. They had once known him, but because they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination. Their foolish heart was darkened. It can happen to any one of us. We, we can have the Bible in our hand, prayers on our lips, and leave the presence of God through our, our thoughts and our desires. Yet in his mercy, says God, did not blot them out of existence. When you think about the idolatry and all the things that Israel went through and how long God labored with them, how we ought to put up with the saints and the church have different opinions than we are who are voting on maybe in the committees and so forth, things that we know are not the will of God, right? We, we need to be, and I said, oneness at what cost? Jesus was patient with Judas. Jesus worked with the disciples because his purpose was to have a group of men who would take the gospel to the world. And if he disrupted that by with getting into the issues with Judas ahead of time, right? When the time was right, did Judas reveal who he was? He got up and walked out into the darkness by his own choice and volition. Jesus never had to push him out the door. If Jesus had thrown him out, there would have been doubts among the, the, the minds of the, the apostles of whether Jesus did the right thing. They already questioned Jesus concerning Judas, right? They, they questioned Jesus about when the alabaster box was broken, all that money was wasted, right? So I'm just telling you. We're no different. We need to be careful that we're not judging Jesus when we're looking at his saints. Through the teachings of sacrificial service, Christ was to be uplifted before all nations. And all who would look to him would what? Live. Christ was the foundation of the Jewish economy. The whole system of types and symbols was a compacted prophecy of the gospel and they knew all of this stuff and they knew all the rituals and all this thing so well, but what did they not recognize? They didn't recognize the Son of Man when he came. And sometimes, in all of our high and mighty thinking, we too may crucify Christ as an imposter. So I challenge you. Move to the next one, please. The disciples, back up. The disciples would go forth as Christ's witnesses to declare to the world what they had seen and heard of him. Their office was the most important to which human beings had ever been called. By the way, I hope you got that. What are you called to be? Disciples of Jesus Christ. Second only to that of Christ himself. <laughs> you know the position that the disciples wanted, that they elbowed and pushed and shoved to get? If they had just waited, and if they just listened to Jesus, guess what they already had? That place right next to Jesus. You can't get any closer. And by the way, neither can I. We are each one and every one invited to be right next to Jesus. Right? Amen. All right, let's go. Um, wonderfully, oh, excuse me, as Christ represented, they, they were to make it on the world. Um, humbling themselves, they would declare that he whom the Jews had crucified was the Prince of Life, the Son of the Living God, and that in his name they did the works that he had done. You remember? They were called in before the council. Oh, why are you doing all this? Oh, we did this stuff in the name of Jesus. How was this man healed? Oh, he was healed in Jesus' name. It wasn't us. This is what Jesus did. You want to blame somebody? Isn't it nice to have somebody to take the blame? Yeah? By the way, he shouldn't only have the blame, but he ought to have the glory, right? Yeah, from us. Go ahead to the next one. In his parting conversation with the disciples on the night before the crucifixion, he made no reference to the suffering that he had endured and must yet endure. He did not speak of the humiliation that was before him, but sought to bring to their minds that which would strengthen their faith leading them to look forward to the joys that await the overcomer. He rejoiced in the consciousness that he could and would do more for his followers than he had promised. 
that from him would flow forth love and compassion, cleansing the soul temple and making men like him in character. That his, tr that, that his truth, armed with the power of the Spirit, would go forth conquering and to conquer. You see, we have a world to win. We have a mission that is way bigger than us. It's bigger than this church, even with the 20 million Seventh-day Adventists. Are you listening? It wouldn't matter if we had 120 million. It still wouldn't be enough without the power of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling Christ in our lives that would bear the witness. Now, I want you to look back at our text just for a moment. What's our text? John 17. Alzheimer's is kicking in, so I ask you the text, all right? No, really. I want you to look at this thing again. This kind of hit me as I was studying my Sabbath school lesson a couple weeks ago. And I don't know if it has a lot of merit, but I want you to weigh it for your own self and think about it. He goes here in, in verse uh, 21. John 17, 21. That they may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. And then it says the crucial statement. That the world may what? Believe. Believe that thou hast sent me. You know, we talk about Jesus coming and being crucified and so forth for us. How is the world going to know that? Well, you say, well, we're going to tell them. Listen, how are you going to tell them? Oh, we're just going to shout it out. No. How did Jesus say they're going to know? When we have that oneness, when we're unified as God's people, when we're marching as one, getting along as we ought to, like God and the Father and the Holy Spirit get along. You think they're having quarrels and arguments and throwing things at each other? <laughs> I, I dare even pose such a question, but I want you to think about it and maybe startle yourself a little bit with the reality if it's happening in your home, in your church, in your life. Maybe that's not what he's talking about. Maybe that's not what he's expecting from us. Let's look on down because I think if Jesus says something twice, it's important. If he says it three or four times, how important is it? All right, so let's look again. Uh, verse 23. Yet I am them, thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the uh, world may know that thou hast sent me. Now, I ask the question, at what cost? Jesus risked being misunderstood. Jesus risked ridicule. Judgmental attitudes of people. In fact, they even said, if this man were really a prophet, he wouldn't mingle with the likes of, and you put the name in there, and somebody might say, Judas. Not only did Jesus have Judas among him, Jesus ordained Judas. Jesus sent Judas out to preach the gospel. Judas cast out demons. Judas baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, right? You see, it was Judas' choice to leave. It was Judas' choice not to harmonize, not to be one with Christ. Christ treated him as though he what? Were. Right? And he knew what was in Judas' heart. But he did everything that heaven could do to help Judas make that right choice. Right? And so I ask you about us. Are we doing the same thing? Is that how we work together? So, in closing, Christ's mission to this world, Christ's care for the lost, is revealed through his people and their burden for the lost and the way they care for each other, right? Another place he said they'll know you're my disciples. By your what? Love one for another. So the truth 
is what the word is founded on. We can't harmonize with people who are not in the truth, right? God's word is truth. And, and so there are going to be people within the church that we cannot harmonize with. But we can exercise oneness toward and we can have a spirit that draws them to, make, to help us if there's any way possible to bring them into what? The, the, the unity, right? And, and that includes our leaders, our institutions, the visitors, whoever else comes uh, toward us, and the people we meet on the street. And, and what's at the core of this thing? And, and let me say this, and I, I don't ever want you to take anything I say out of here and try to uh, make some issue out of it. But you and I have the responsibility to give each other credibility. Are you listening? We have the responsibility to give each other the credibility. So let's say, for instance, that my brother, who is an elder of the church, goes and studies with someone for baptism, and he brings and says, Pastor, I've got this person ready for baptism. We've scheduled a date. They're going to, you know. And I say to him, oh, no, I'm not going to baptize that one. I've got to study with myself. they got to through, go through my checklist and my question. You can't decide whether they're ready to be baptized. What would that do for his authority as an elder in the church, for his responsibility? Yeah, we can talk, we can discuss, you know, have you asked him about this, whatever. But the bottom line is, he is a leader, he, ha I, he should have my vote of confidence as a leader, right? All right? As a fellow pastor, would I expect some pastor to say, oh no, <laughs> you, you people aren't ready for baptism. I can't do that. I can't do that. We, we've got to work on the same page and trust each other. And by the way, we're not all the same and never will be. In heaven, we're going to know as we're known. You ever thought about what that means? Is my character all, all, all of a sudden going to conform in my, my personality and I'll be just like uh, Brother Lou back there? And you see me, you'll think you're seeing Brother Lou? <laughs> He said he hoped not. <laughs> Thank you for that, Brother Lou, but I don't think that's the way I was looking at this. <laughs> All right? But you understand what I'm saying? We're never going to be identical. That's not what oneness means. Oneness means that we work together in our diversity. In fact, our lesson brought out one place that the diversity is where the oneness makes the difference, right? And that's what makes oneness wonderful. You know, God has given to the church various gifts, and we have various amounts of them, each one of us. So we want to remember all that. But I just want to ask you today, what price are you putting on oneness? When I say oneness, at what cost? And I, I illustrated a little bit to you what Jesus put on it, how he valued it, to the point that he was willing to resist, to, to risk his own reputation as he's making decisions and choices that affect what? The, the eternal home of his disciples and those that he's sharing and ministering for. And he cared little about what others thought because what he was doing was the right thing by the word and for the purpose of salvation, right? His whole thing was about reconciliation. His whole thing was about throwing heaven wide open for as many as he possibly could while never compromising the law and the word of God because what? That cannot be changed. That's part of his character, right? So we can't, we can't downgrade the scripture in order to unify. But at the same time, we can unify and harmonize as far as possible to try to get people to the same plane with the Holy Spirit of the scripture, right? And that's what we're supposed to be doing. Are, are you willing to sacrifice maybe your reputation, your opinion, to at the very least wait on the Lord for his time to happen? He was patient with Judas those whole three and a half years, right? He knew day one what Judas was going to decide because he's God, right? But he gave him every opportunity and he never treated him in any way that made the disciples think that he knew something about Judas they didn't know, right? You understand what I'm saying? A little bit? Huh? 
So what are you willing to pay personally that we might be one collectively? Is that a good question? How, how many of you are willing to make the surrender? That you're going to make the effort to be like Jesus in bringing harmony and unity within the household of faith. Are you willing to do that? Amen. Amen. God help us, each and every one. Maybe somebody today has seen something that, that God has spoken to your heart that you need to change. You need to make a transformation. You need to confess, confess to the Lord <clears throat> that I need to have a new direction in my life. If, you, if you've made that kind of choice, that kind of decision, would you just raise your hand? Amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, as we leave this house today, may it be with renewed courage to be faithful to you. May it be with a desire that we, like you, might be patient, knowing that the victory is already yours, knowing that you're going to carry your church through, help us to care about it with carefulness, prayerfulness, that we might, without compromising our faith of the truth, always be united, that our spirit might be in harmony with yours, that our will might be one with you. And Lord, as we maneuver through these last days, the turmoil that's coming, help us keep in perspective the business you've given us to do, that we be not distracted by the news by the rioting, by the dissension, but that we remain faithful, steadfast, till the end. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.